Chapter 1. Living well depends upon thinking well, about the things that matter. When we talk about overthinking, we're not talking about having our basic needs met, like a place to sleep or where we'll find our next meal. Those fundamental questions merit concern and require thought, sometimes lots of it. And it is not talking about major life decisions, like whether to change careers or end a relationship or move across the country. Big decisions like these require dedicated thought. Overthinking means those times when we lavish mental energy on things that don't deserve it, those times when we can't seem to think about anything else, even though we know our thoughts are better spent elsewhere. Overthinking takes different forms. Sometimes it looks like worry. We might feel stuck reviewing something we've done in the past or imagining something that might happen in the future. We might spend 20 minutes leaping to imaginative and dire conclusions about that short email from our boss or the note from our child's teacher. Or we may construct an elaborate and scary scenario in our mind about why our mom hasn't returned our call. We might lie awake at night wondering what our friends really think of us, or if a loved one seems tired of us, or if our library finds are getting really and truly out of control. Overthinking may look like fretting about the small stuff, devoting disproportionate amounts of brain space to the relatively insignificant. We might catch ourselves in the middle of a long train of thought about whether we should exchange that new pair of jeans for the next size up, or why the washing machine water doesn't seem as hot as it used to and what we should do about it. Whether the concern elbowing into our thoughts is big or small, we recognize the common thread— These thoughts are repetitive, unhealthy, and unhelpful. Our brains are hard at work, but accomplishing nothing. It is exhausting and makes us feel crappy. Dr. Susan Nolan Hoeksema was a psychology professor at Yale whose research focused on women's mental health and well-being. Her studies over a 20-year period showed that overthinking makes life harder, hurts our relationships, and may contribute to mental disorders like depression, severe anxiety, and alcohol abuse. When we spend our time overthinking, that's what we're doing. Let's face it, nobody wants to live a life characterized by overthinking, but it doesn't feel like something we're choosing. It feels like something we can't escape. We don't want to fritter away our one precious life, second-guessing ourselves about a conversation we had last Thursday, or whether we're sick enough to go to the doctor, or when we're going to squeeze in a Costco run this week. We want better for ourselves, but we're not sure how to get there. This book is for those who would like to look back one day and declare a life well lived. Living well depends upon thinking well about the things that matter. We want to learn how to overcome decision fatigue, stop feeling overwhelmed, and bring more peace and joy into our lives. That means learning strategies for approaching both our minutes and our days. Chapter 2 Practicing new ways of thinking and reinforcing new habits of thought will prevent overthinking. Anne Bogle, in her first book, Reading People, wrote about how the way we see ourselves has enormous implications on how we live our lives. I'm the kind of person who, blank, is a powerful statement, no matter what goes in that blank. A shift in our sense of identity, that is, a shift in how we fill in that blank, can cause massive changes in our behavior almost instantly. Starting now, Don't describe yourself as a chronic overthinker. Don't call yourself that, not even in your own head. Overthinking is no longer part of your identity, though it may be a behavior you're engaging in right now. Instead, begin to describe yourself, if only in your head, as someone who is capable of experiencing less decision angst and more joy and peace, can learn to make confident, competent decisions, doesn't need to habitually second-guess herself, is learning how to filter out the unimportant, unhealthy, and unhelpful, is developing strategies for stopping overthinking in its tracks, is becoming equipped to gracefully pivot when things don't go as planned, can put overthinking aside to welcome good things into her life. Shifting your mindset is just the first step, but it's an important one. Now you've got some work to do. Improvement won't happen on its own, and it won't happen overnight but it will happen. Learning to think well is a process. Some strategies are simple to implement, while others are harder. Some really will feel like hitting a button, while others will require perseverance. Adopting new mental practices and patterns of thought may feel daunting at first, and it's no wonder. 
In The Chemistry of Calm, Dr. Henry Emmons, an integrative psychiatrist who advocates a holistic approach to mental health problems like depression and anxiety, writes that it's no surprise we feel our current wild mind state is our natural way of being. He writes, Since childhood, we have spent many of our waking hours reinforcing our habits of thought. We empower them through attention and repetition. Anything we practice this consistently, we will eventually get good at. Dr. Henry Emmons We've become good at overthinking, thanks or no thanks, to all the practice we've put in. That's why we need to start practicing new strategies. And as we practice new ways of thinking and reinforce new habits of thought, we will become much better at not overthinking. Did you know? Many of us strengthen unhealthy nerve circuits through repetitive practice. Every time we repeat a fearful or defeatist thought, we strengthen the connections that make it easier to have that thought again. Chapter 3 Analysis paralysis is one of the most common manifestations of overthinking. When we're in its grip, the problem is not the underlying decision itself, but the way we approach it. Instead of helping us solve the problem, our mental habits make us more entrenched in indecision. Analysis paralysis is dangerous because, left alone, it will never resolve itself. We can't think our way out of it. Unless we recognize what's happening and intervene, we will remain stuck. Certainty is missing the point entirely. Anne Lamott Common signs of analysis paralysis include repeatedly putting off decisions until later, postponing a decision in hopes that a better option will present itself, seeking more options when we already have enough, constantly reviewing the same information we've already gathered, fearing we will make the wrong decision, waiting so long to decide that we miss the opportunity to do so, second-guessing a decision after it is made. Causes of Analysis Paralysis Analysis paralysis does not affect us all equally. Some of us are more inclined than others to get caught in this specific trap. Sometimes our less helpful tendencies, like perfectionism, predictably reel us in. Intellectual curiosity. When seeking a solution, highly intelligent people may see whole landscapes of possibilities that others don't see, which may inadvertently lead them to make simple decisions needlessly complex. These positive traits have an unintended consequence. They make us prone to analysis paralysis because they prod us to search for additional options, whether or not we need them. Information overload. When we're making a decision, more information can be a good thing. The problem is not the impulse to gather information, but the degree to which we follow it. Gathering data and examining options are beneficial, but at a certain point, that hunt for information not only has diminishing returns, but becomes actively unhelpful. Before long, we're trapped by our own thoughts, believing that if only we can find a new data point, identify the needed resource, or think a little harder about the issue, the answer will become clear. Information is good until it's bad. Perfectionism Perfectionism may manifest itself as any of the following. Regular procrastination. A need to find the right answer before moving forward. All or nothing thinking. Struggles with completing a project because there's always more we could do. A critical eye that homes in on imperfections. Frequently second-guessing past decisions. Antidotes to analysis paralysis. We get in trouble when we act as though the ideal answers to our questions are out there somewhere. We may believe that when we finally discover the right answer, it will seem obvious. And so we stew and stew without arriving at a resolution, our overthinking manifesting as worry, doubt, and stagnation. We can't keep searching for perfect solutions, interesting as the pursuit may be, because perfect solutions don't exist. Get moving. To extricate yourself from analysis paralysis, you don't need more information. You need to act. This does not mean something big and bold, although that's certainly called for at times. Even taking a baby step forward can shift your momentum and get you unstuck. Kick perfectionism to the curb. Perfectionism makes us critical, uptight, and generally not fun to be around. Plus, we're more likely to overthink when we're in a bad mood. There's no need to be so hard on ourselves because it doesn't have to be perfect to be good. Did you know 
Second-guessing takes a tremendous amount of time and energy, adds considerably to our stress loads, and limits our capacity to make wise decisions in the future. Chapter 4 Needing to choose between two good options can lead to overthinking. Take action in order to move forward. We all want to make good decisions in life. We may automatically slow down when facing a big decision because we want to make sure we're taking it seriously. Purposeful waiting has a place. There are times for slow and methodical decisions. If you're contemplating how to deal with a difficult family member, whether you should go back to school or if you can afford to buy a house, time may be exactly what you need. At a certain point, waiting time becomes wasted time. We think moving slowly will help us, but we can spend so much time considering our options that we get stuck in analysis paralysis. We need to remember that important doesn't necessarily require slow every step of the way. There comes a time when a decision doesn't need any more thought, and past this point, we're overthinking it. We don't need to keep pondering, we need to speed up. That is, make a decision and take some action. Sometimes it's easy to differentiate between purposeful pondering and overthinking. Other times, it takes a while to recognize what's going on. But with practice, you'll get better at recognizing when slowing down is a hindrance instead of a help and learn what to do about it. Here are some signals that it's time to move on. When making a decision between two good choices. Deciding between two good options sounds like a great position to be in, but it's surprisingly tough because there may be no right answer and no clear way to decide. Our instinct may be to slow down until the right answer becomes obvious, but we do so at our peril. If we're not careful, we can plunge straight into analysis paralysis. When we're facing two good options, we don't need more time. We need to move on. When you know what to do, but you are dragging your feet. Whether the issue is big or small, if we don't like the answer, we may be tempted to keep searching for a better one, even if a better answer isn't going to arrive. We may not like the answer because we're feeling lazy, or it's not perfect, or we're worried about looking dumb. That doesn't mean it's not the right one. And once we have that answer, we still need to follow through. When we put off doing something we don't want to do, we keep the unpleasant thing right in front of us for much longer than we need to. As long as we're contemplating the issue, we're dwelling on the negative. If we're dreading something, we can serve ourselves well by dealing with it sooner rather than later. If we're overthinking something we can actually do something about, the best thing we can do is speed up to move on. Take action as soon as possible. When you're tempted to beat yourself up, Sometimes we slow down because while we have moved forward externally, we haven't moved forward mentally or emotionally. It may look like we've sped up, but we're still wobbling on the inside. When we know we need to move forward, we must do it with our whole selves, with our actions and our minds. As long as we're contemplating the issue, we're dwelling on the negative. Nobody's got time or headspace for that. Don't wallow. Don't wobble. Move on. Did you know? We think moving slowly will help us, but we can spend so much time considering our options that we get stuck in analysis paralysis. We need to remember that important doesn't necessarily require slow every step of the way. Chapter 5. You can only make so many decisions in a day, so look for ways to clear away your mental clutter. Each decision we make throughout the day takes a toll on our finite amount of mental energy. What to have for breakfast, which route to take to work, how to handle a tricky conversation, whether to buy new jeans before the sale ends, how our child will get home from practice on Friday. Each small decision requires only a bit of brain power, but the cumulative effect is large. The more choices we encounter, the more likely we are to succumb to decision fatigue. This is the state where we become exhausted from making decision after decision. Our ability to choose breaks down. Unless we are on guard, we may not consciously notice decision fatigue creeping in. When we're physically tired, we know it. We can tell when we're short on sleep or worn out from a hard workout because we feel it in our bodies. But decision fatigue is sneaky. Instead of feeling specifically tired in a certain way, we feel overwhelmed. To avoid decision fatigue, it helps to think of our mental energy as we would a budget, or more aptly, a per diem. 
We can't make decision after decision without paying a price. The more decisions we make in a day, the worse the quality of our decisions will be over time. Our mental capacity to tackle them erodes and we start to overthink. Conversely, the more decisions we eliminate, the longer we'll retain our decision-making capacity throughout the day. Strategies to Streamline Decisions Let's explore some specific strategies you can establish to limit your options and streamline recurring decisions. Eat the same thing. It's remarkable how many decisions we face every day about food. Food and mealtimes play a huge role in our rhythms of life, so when we streamline these things, we save big. Adopt a signature dish. This is a reliable recipe you're always prepared to make for friends. That way, you don't have to spend your mental energy deciding what to serve, and you don't have to worry about choosing or executing a new recipe when guests come over. Instead, you can fall into your regular routine, at least as far as the food is concerned, and focus on your friends. Limit yourself to one time. If you find yourself constantly thinking about how to fit something into your schedule or when to fit it in, limiting your options by establishing a set time can help. Committing to a set time is hard for some people, but once that time is set, you don't have to think about it anymore. Limit technology creep. We can't talk about limiting our options without talking about smartly managing our relationship with technology, because if we're not careful, our handy little devices can take over our lives, even if that's exactly what we don't want. And every time they do, we will need to decide to say yes or no. Limit those constant recurring decisions by setting smart guidelines now. Are you constantly asking yourself if now would be a good time to pull out your device? Consider implementing device-free zones in your life, a physical space and or a set time when you put your device away. Did you know our digital devices can do us a world of good, but they can also encourage decision fatigue? Be smart about how you engage, lest your device become the boss of you instead of the other way around. Chapter 6. When things beyond our control inevitably happen, we have to change course, and we have to do it fast. Some of us seek opportunities to be spontaneous and go off script, while others have a plan for every minute of their day. But whether we're go with the flow by nature or prefer a carefully crafted routine, life can force us to improvise. Things beyond our control inevitably happen. The sitter cancels, the rain necessitates a change of plans, the power goes out, and we have to pivot in the moment, making the best of the situation. We have to change course, and we have to do it fast. Why not seize the pleasure at once? How often is happiness destroyed by preparation, foolish preparation? Jane Austen These moments when things go sideways often feel like something we have to survive. Any kind of time-sensitive situation where we have to make a choice right now is ripe for overthinking and decision paralysis. We can't prepare for every situation, but we can plan for things going awry, as they certainly will. An unexpected turn of events may throw us into momentary disarray, but if we can push through the messy middle of renegotiating our decisions in a hurry, we may find joy on the other side. The trick is knowing how to get there. Just pick something. When it comes to overthinking, any opportunity for decision-making is fraught with peril, especially when time is of the essence. Even choosing between good options is tough, and the added time pressure raises the stakes. It's easy to feel overwhelmed in the moment and to choose poorly because of it. When it's clear a decision is needed to move forward, the worst thing we can do is not act. Making a choice, any choice, is better than staying stuck debating our options, letting the moment pass us by. Just pick something, anything. It's better than doing nothing. And besides, things that don't unfold according to plan often make the best memories. Lean in, expecting good things. Our perspective impacts how well we deal with the situation at hand. When we perceive the stakes to be high, we're more likely to freeze, especially if we're prone to perfectionism. When spontaneity strikes, it's helpful to purposefully adopt a low-stakes mindset. Instead of striving to choose the ideal option, we can aim to choose a good one, reminding ourselves that the best memories often start with something going wrong. 
And then, instead of resisting the change of plans, we can lean in, expecting good things. As a bonus, this lowers our anxiety, which makes it easier to decide. Build a margin for the unexpected. When we're operating at 100% capacity, we're unable to deviate from our plans. We don't have the margin. But by making space in our schedules, that is, by not maintaining lives and calendars that are jammed to capacity, we are better able to improvise. One of the ways to do this is by planning to meet deadlines early, knowing full well that things may go wrong and schedules may get disrupted. When we're prepared, we're available to seize opportunities as they present themselves, whether they are thrust upon us or we invite them in. Did you know, when faced with an unexpected moment of decision, it's easy to freeze. But to get to the other side where the good stuff is, you have to enter into the messy middle of uncertainty and decision. The joy is at the end, and the only way out is through. Conclusion When we don't recognize our overthinking behavior for what it is, it's impossible to get over it. And as long as we rely on decision-making styles that encourage overthinking, we're going to spend a lot of time overthinking. But once we see what's really going on, we can begin to change. It will feel like a battle at first, especially if we've been analyzing things to death our whole lives, but with time, it will begin to feel like a habit. Try this. Describe yourself differently. The way we see ourselves has enormous implications for how we live our lives. Stop describing yourself as a chronic overthinker, rather as someone who is capable of experiencing less decision angst and more joy and peace, can learn to make confident, competent decisions, doesn't need to habitually second-guess herself, is learning how to filter out the unimportant, unhealthy, and unhelpful is developing strategies for stopping overthinking in its tracks, is becoming equipped to gracefully pivot when things don't go as planned, can put overthinking aside to welcome good things into her life.